Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Are you hearing me out there? Yes, we can. Yes, hear you. Great, wonderful. All right. Uh, my name is Alicia Whittingham Gill. I'm the Staff Welfare Liaison Officer for the region. And I want to thank you all for coming to another session of our Meditation Mondays this, this evening. Our moderator will be none other than Ms. Zoe Shim, psychologist at Cornwall Regional Hospital. And she's here to speak to us about grief, the whole shebang about grief. It's happening all around us. So we have invited her to come and speak to us. And by extension, we speak to her about this topic. So without any further ado, I will turn over to Ms. Shim. Well, pleasant afternoon to everyone. I hope everyone is in good spirits. And even though we have somewhat of a somber topic to talk about today, I think it is important because, you know, it's happening all around us, like um, she said a while ago. And, uh, you know, oftentimes the most, the most common question I get is how can I support a grieving person? Or what am I supposed to do with myself with all this grief happening to me and around me? You know, um, is there space within me to be grieving for myself but yet want to be a support system for others? Am I overextending myself? How do I know when I'm doing too much or too little? You know, what is it that I can expect as well? Because, you know, these times are ever more pressuring. I mean, if we thought things were stressful before COVID, can you imagine what it's like now, you know? And so it's definitely something that I think it is necessary. It's something that is worth a conversation about. And so we're going to just kick things off and um, as you know, as most of you would know, I am a counseling and educational psychologist. So for me, it's pretty much quite easy for me to want to have a bit of a mix. So it's a psychoeducational type of session I'd like for us to have. And um, I'm going to be sharing my entire screen. So that way, persons will be able to um, the recording is able to see the chat and all of that good stuff. So as the questions pop up, I will be in a position to answer them throughout. Feel free to stop me as we go, as well as, you know, just interject at any time, right? Because um, it's not just about what I have to say. I want to hear from you guys. I want to hear the feedback. I want to know if I'm moving too fast, if it's, if it's hitting the nail on the head, all the things, right? And I think this very first slide that you see here is pretty much telling of what grief, what we want grief to do and what grief actually looks like, right? So as you can see here, most of us want and would love for grief to be a linear thing. You know, it's definitely something where we say, okay, this bad thing has happened. I want to be sad for like, two days and then I want to be able to move on from it and that kind of thing versus what it actually looks like, which is non-linear, up and down and around a ball of mats, very much stressful, right? It's a, a combination of things that we're constantly going through the motions. And so as a result of that, you know, we definitely have our up and downs. And so here we are, we have the work set out for us, more than we'd like. I would like to apologize if the background audio is a little noisy, you know, we can't help the highway, but <laughs> I hopefully my voice will be um, loud enough. And I just want to check and make sure I'm gonna put the chat open just to make sure, is everybody hearing me clearly? Is everybody okay? You can always just indicate in the chat first and foremost. Just want to make sure you're hearing me okay. Yes, no, maybe so. 
Loud and clear. Okay, beautiful. All right. So, of course, there are certain terms and stuff associated with grief that we tend to use interchangeably. Sometimes we use it um, in out of the incorrect context and stuff. So, we all, I always like to start off with the definitions to make sure that we're all understanding what I mean when I say certain stuff, right? So loss is the fact or process of losing something or someone. Grief is that emotional response. Bereavement is that period of mourning. And mourning, of course, is the period of acceptance of loss and grief, right? So loss is the thing that you, have, that you no longer have. Grief is the emotional response. Bereavement is the time frame in which you use to try and accept this loss. And of course, mourning, again, is also that full length of time from the moment you lose something to the point of acceptance and learning to live with it. Now, one of the major things I want to say before we get any further is that with grief, with anything that you experience a loss or you know that grief process associated with it is that you never get over something. Jamaicans have a horrible habit of saying, at time you get over that man. And where grief is concerned, you never get over something. You learn to live with it. You learn to live through it. You learn to live despite, you know, you learn to adjust, but you don't actually get over it, right? The fact that you have a grieving process, it equates to the fact that this is something that was significant in your enough in your life to have an impact and with it no longer there, you have to figure out a way of how to live without that, right? So why is it that we even should discuss grief aside from the fact that we're all experiencing it? Grief represents our emotional response to the loss as well as the fear of the dramatic life change that will likely result from the loss, right? And, you know, Grief is not just the loss of a person. It can be several different things. Um, having, having several counseling sessions with teenagers, for example, their major grief process with COVID is the lack of socialization, the loss of face-to-face -face interaction with persons. I've had counseling sessions with children who grieve the loss of play dates, of having the freedom to read facial expressions when they go in the supermarket. Some of us um, can grieve the loss of being able to just go to the movies by themselves or with a few girlfriends or just being able to be out at dinner without having to watch the time because of curfew. We can grieve a lot of things, right? And grieving that loss, you know, is that dramatic life change that we have to adjust to. And everybody experiences grief in their own unique way. So... I may, when I am grieving, holler and ball and roll and can't get out of bed, another person becomes hyper-dedicated to their career. Another person might be really angry and bitter with the world. Another person can be completely quiet and seem completely unfazed by the things, right? But emotional support for the grieving party is an essential component for working through grief or overcoming it. And support comes from family and friends, but it can also come from professionals like counselors who are able to offer non-judgmental understanding, a listening ear and a practical way forward. So today's session is all about understanding what grief is, what is it to be expected, how we can handle grief, what to say, what not to say, and ourselves, giving ourselves grace to grieve as well, right? So the cliche theory, and I couldn't have this session without talking about the most famous stages of grief by Kubler-Ross. Now, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross divided the behavior and thinking of dying persons into five stages, and it's throughout the years have translated to the grief response as well, the stages of grief. And how she came up with this theory was actually observing thousands of terminally ill patients 
and noting the emotional roller coaster that they go through as they approach their end, their end of life, right? And also observing the loved ones surrounding these persons. And she came up with this theory. So for her theory, she says that you go through these stages of grief in this particular order. However, we can easily, and I'm sure from personal experience that all of you have experienced that, you know, we don't go through these stages in a neat and tidy way. We ping pong between all the different ones, right? So the first thing typically is denial and isolation. When you experience a loss or something that is devastating or something that's, you know, is quite sad to you, the first thing is to say, no man, can't really, right? And then another part of you is to isolate, to say you don't want to talk about it, you don't want to be around persons. The second stage, of course, is anger. Why did this have to happen to me? What did I do to deserve all of this? How come them get to be so happy with their loved one and I don't have it? Then the third stage is bargaining. And usually that involves, you know, um, some kind of contemplation or conversation with your higher person. So bargaining like, God, if you just give me back this person, I promise I'll go to church more. I'll serve you better. God, if you just allow me to just say goodbye to this person or give me one more day with this person, I promise I'll save more money and be a better person, etc. And then the whole reality of the situation hits you. And then the next stage happens, which is depression, a prolonged, a prolonged experience of, uh, of bargain, of depression and sadness to say that you know, you are feeling upset, devastated, and that kind of thing. And then eventually, one hopes that to complete the grieving process to a certain extent is acceptance. Acknowledging the fact that you, know, you are in fact around and, you know, that kind of thing. So, like I said, for those persons just joining us, okay? Oops, sorry. For those of us just joining us, we're talking about grief and the five stages of grief. And we established that, you know, it's definitely not something that happens in a neat and tidy order like what you see here, what you see on the screen here. But we can definitely expect these five emotional reactions. Denial and isolation, anger, bargaining, depression, and eventually acceptance. And not to mention the fact that you can be in a place of acceptance and then go back to being in denial or getting angry or bargaining with God again and depression. We can go back and forth and through and through and up and down, right? And as I've been saying repeatedly, there's no neat progression from one stage to the next. In reality, there's much looping back or stages can hit at the same time or occur out of order. So why bother with it? It's because it's a good general guide of what to expect. You know, um, oftentimes persons will call me in a panic and say, Zoe, so-and-so just lost their mother. They're quite devastated. And when I ask, how long ago did this happen? Oh, it happened an hour ago. I, as a counselor, would not be effective during that time because that person might still be in shock. They might be in denial or isolation. They're not in a place to receive any counseling just then per se you know oftentimes when we look at these different stages of grief it may not be the most effective to um apply the emotional support right away you have to give room for persons to process on an individual level so of course there are different factors that can affect the grief process right and not to say that um a person's loss um, cannot vary, but you know, there are definitely certain factors that make the grieving part process that much harder, right? For example, the type of loss, you know, loss of a child, loss of a grandparent, loss of a friend versus a parent. So, you know, what is it? What is the type of loss? The nature of the attachment as well can also say a lot about the grief process, right? So, for example, 
if you find that that person was your right hand or you're very close or somebody that was actively in your life on a daily basis, then of course the grieving process for that person or thing might be that much more intense than someone who you just hear from once a year or hear in passing, right? There's also something to be said about the security of the attachment. How necessary was that person or thing for their sense of well-being, right? So for example, I had a friend who lost her dog <clears throat> and it's a dog that she had for five years. And, you know, it, in, and, and to be honest, you know, a lot of Jamaicans might say, why are you devastated about a dog? And for her, that dog was her companion. That was her baby. You know, that dog had seen her through, you know, the ups and downs of different relationships, has seen her go through many losses. And that dog has always been there for her. And for that dog to now pass away, you know, it left a whole, a huge gap, right? And so for her, that is what complicated the grieving process for her dog. Another person may say to themselves, um, I was never... I'm close to my father. So when I heard that my father died, it didn't do much for me. And another person will say, I'm not close to my father, but I'm not sure if he even loved me. So when you look at the security of an attachment as well, it can also determine how hard or easy the grief process can be. You'll find that persons who are secure in what they know about what that relationship was about, they definitely have an easier time to a certain extent adjusting versus someone who was insecure. So if you say, oh, this person died and I'm not sure if they, if they even loved me or the last conversation was an argument, that kind of thing, then definitely it can affect the relationship and the grieving process. And that goes kind of into the ambivalence in the relationship. Were there positive and negative feelings? Was it a relationship where you know <clears throat> you were fighting most of the time and now you feel like you wasted a lot of that time right we can also look at the mode of death too as part of what affects the grieving process right was it natural was it accidental was it suicidal was it homicidal you know um unfortunately with covid we know that the number of suicides unfortunately has gone up quite a bit um, we may not hear about it in the news due to the privacy of families, but it's something that's definitely on the rise. And I find that especially in our Jamaican culture, uh, mourning someone who committed suicide is kind of taboo, you know. And of course, that also affects the grieving process. Um, sudden and unexpected versus advanced warning, the geographic location of the person lost. You know, we know that with COVID as well, someone passes away, you're unable to travel or attend the funeral and that kind of thing. So those things can also affect it. And of course, personality variables. We all know that coping resources and styles are very different from person to person. You might have some of us that can rely on our faith or go and exercise or have a good support system who knows how to be there for you, um, or some of us who don't have much psychological resilience. And especially in these times, we know that grief happens in groups. It's not just a one-off instance. It's the loss of this, then two months later, something else is lost. Then two weeks later, you hear something else. Not to mention just looking at what's on the news and everything. It's very easy to get caught into this loop of constantly freshly grieving about different things, right? And we know what grief can look like on a cognitive level, which is what your mindset is like. So there can be disbelief, disorientation, confusion, preoccupation, um, you know, all of those things. It can be behavioral where you find that you have sleep and appetite disturbances, whether you're sleeping too much or too little, eating too much or too little a lot of us we eat of our, eat our emotions so when we're sad and we feel lonely and we don't feel like we have that hug we eat instead some of us don't have any appetite at all when we're grieving social withdrawal dreaming about the losses avoiding reminders 
searching or calling out for that person, crying, of course, visiting places or carrying objects, all the things, right? We know what all of these things are like. And of course, we know that there are physical manifestations of grief too. You know, a lot of the times we have persons who will come and say, boy, I can't stop this nauseous feeling or I have this hollow feeling in my chest or my head always feel tight. We need to go doctor, go check it out because I, there must be something wrong with me. And then when you take a stock and have a conversation about their stressors, the things that they are grieving about, right? You find that it's manif physical manifestations of that emotional toll, right? So you can have tightness in the chest or throat, heightened sensitivity to noise and light, breathlessness, weakness, lack of energy, dry mouth, and of course, depersonalization. A lot of times, persons who are actively grieving will tell you, say, listen, me day about me, not day, you know, or I'm just going through the motions, I'm just getting by. And of course, we have our social manifestations as well, where you have tr traditions and rituals that may or may not facilitate grief. And of course, with COVID and all its restrictions as well, the nine nights, the dead yard, the funeral, the repast, all the things that we would have done socially to kind of assist the grieving, again, is not really there for us right now. And What's important to know is that there are so many different types of grief, right? I'm sure many of you would be surprised. They think that grief is just grief and is just full stop. But as you can see the list here on the screen, there are so many. Look at that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Over about 15 different types of grief. So when I say to you that you we are all grieving at this point. You may not be conscious of it, but definitely there's some amount of grieving that's taking place in each and every one of our lives. We may be at different stages. We may be experiencing it at different points or varying levels of intensity, but definitely, definitely we are all experiencing some type of grief, right? So for example, you have anticipatory grief where you anticipate or you know that someone is about to pass away or you're gearing up to lose a friend. And it can be something as seemingly simple as knowing that a coworker is going off on leave for three months or they're going to a new job. And you're saying, you know what? I don't know how I'm going to manage when this person gone, you know. How am I going to manage in the office without this person here? This person always used to make me laugh or just make the days feel a little shorter anticipatory grief is something where you say boy there's gonna come a day where my mommy going past to you know and that type of grief as well can be just as overwhelming right you have normal grief quote unquote and that usually means that you are able to experience the five stages of grief and reach to a point of acceptance we have delayed grief where i know that there's many of you listening right now you are always the delayed griever meaning that when something happens you're the one to make sure you sort out everything you plan you organize you get everything going everybody say oh you're strong and then i know how you manage and when everybody pack up and gone home and everything organized and the person has been buried and everything has been neatly tucked away everything just hits you right that's the delayed grief. You always see that person that seem like they're holding it together right up until when the person being lowered into the ground and they're the first one to just break down. That's delayed grief. Complicated grief now is when a person has very unhealthy coping skills or you find that they're grieving for a much longer time frame than you think is healthy. So say, for example, you've lost something and four years later, you're still unable to get out of bed at the thought of the grieving process or at the thought of that loss. That's when things get complicated. You also have disenfranchised grief, which a lot of us, especially who work in the, in the helping industry, you know, a lot of us can say that we can experience disenfranchised grief too. 
in that, you know, there's a lot of persons without jobs right now and they're grieving the loss of their jobs. And it's almost like you feel almost guilty for complaining about the jobs that you do have because persons will turn around and say, at least you have a job. At least you have something. At least you're not locked up in your house every day. You get to go out and be around people every day, right? That's a kind of disenfranchised grief because, you know, you, you want to grieve the loss of something, but persons are telling you that you don't have no right to feel that way, or at least it's not as bad as that person. That's a form of grief as well, disenfranchised grief. You have chronic grief as well, which is something where you experience the stages of grief at an amplified level. So when you're in denial, you're really in denial. When you're angry, you are explosively angry. When you are depressed, you are, you know, unable to eat or sleep and get out of bed or bathe because it's such an intense feeling. That's chronic grief. Many of us also have cumulative grief which means that you have more than one things building up that's causing you to grieve. So you've lost a, a family pet, you've lost your job, you've lost a loved one, you watch the news and hear about this other person, your sister grieving somebody too, you know? That's cumulative grief. We also have masked grief, wherein you just pretend like nothing is wrong, you're not losing anybody. That's considered masked grief. You're putting on a mask, and you're just acting like everything is fine, right? And there are so many others here, but as you can see, these are the main ones. But it's just to reiterate my point that all of us are experiencing some type of grief in one way or the other, some form or another. And hopefully you're able to now assign a label to it because oftentimes there's many of us that say, boy, I feel sad, I feel overwhelmed, I feel all of these different emotions. And you don't feel like grief is quite the word or it's grief, but you, you need a neater, a neater label for it. So hopefully now it has given you something like that, you know, anticipatory, normal, delayed, complicated, etc. And of course, with seeing everything on the news and watching everything, there's a lot of anxiety that comes with grieving as well. Because with grieving, with losing things, it makes you come face to face with what you may be struggling with or your personal fears associated with your life, right? So there are some common fears about dying and loss, you know, such as the process. Will it be painful? How will you get through it? The loss of control. Many of us, you know, feel like the grieving process is so difficult because you don't have a handle on it. It's not like you're going to get a text message to tell you, oh, so-and-so is going to die tomorrow at 10 o'clock, so just brace yourself. Oh, you're going to get bad news tomorrow at 4, so just go and prepare yourself. There's a lot of loss of control, you know? Loss of loved ones, you know? You're thinking about what's going to happen to them. How will they manage without you? And even looking at and wondering others' reactions. You know, what if I see fear in the eyes of others? How do I respond to differences? You know, we also worry about the isolation aspect and the fear of the unknown. And, you know, this fear that you've been doing all of what you're doing all along for it to mean nothing. Did my life have an impact? Did it have any meaning? You know, all of this is a part of the grieving process as well. So now that we have looked at and tackled about grief, all which way we slice it, dice it, and look at it in all the different ways, how is it that we, how exactly do we cope with it? And I want to tell you this from now, and I'm sure for the month of June, there's going to be, I see somebody raising their hand. Yes, there's a hand raised. Yes, Marcia Green. I just want to ask this question. I'm not um, uh, I want to find out: Can you be grieving, um, not, and not knowingly that you, not knowing that you are grieving about something? Of course, it's called masked grief. It can be distorted grief. So you find yourself moving through the motions, but you can't quite pinpoint what is happening. It could be the fact that there's so many people around you going through losses and you're like, 
well, I haven't lost anything directly, but you know, you are grieving that other people are sad as well, you know, and you're grieving, you're feeling for them. So yes, you can experience grief and not know that it's grief that you're experiencing. That's a very good question. Very true. That's very much a thing, right? So how do we experience it and how do we cope with it? And I want to highlight the fact right now that there are definite gender differences in mourning. And I hope that with time, this will be less of a thing, but for right now and so far, I continuously see this difference. And we find that women frequently express that they feel their male counterparts are not grieving or supporting, you know? Oftentimes when a grief or a loss has taken place, women tend to be far more expressive, far more emotional, far more open with what they're experiencing, while men tend to clam up. They go into Mr. Fix-It mode, right? They're the ones that will say, tell me what we need for you to help you. Do you need me to mow the lawn? Do you need to set up this? Who I need to pick up from the airport? They go into the problem solving mode. They don't actually want to necessarily express their emotions. If you notice when you go to funerals, the men are often outside chatting and the women are inside crying. You always tend to see that separation based on gender. And it's a similar thing with mourning, right? With grieving. Often men say that they do not know how best to support their female loved ones or how to handle the emotion and pain that stems from it. So oftentimes a man will freeze up seeing a woman cry. It's like, oh, I don't know how to fix it. I just want her to stop crying. When really and truly, oftentimes we as women just want that shoulder, that room to cry and have those emotions out. But both men and women need support in grief. As much as the men go into Mr. Fix-It mode and women go into whether the quiet or balling mode or the emotional mode, both of you require support, right? You need to hear from others. Their emotions are normal. Their responses to the emotions are normal and that they will be able to live and love again, right? There's always that need for reassurance to say, cry as much as you want to. Not, no man, no bother with the balling, no bother, ease up with the balling, please, right? There's always that, that, rea that need for reassur reassurance. So like I said, <clears throat> men tend to be more comfortable attending to life changes by taking on new roles and responsibilities. So for example, if they know that daddy has passed away and daddy used to take care of the yard and the car maintenance, they have no problem stepping up and saying, you know what, me go and service the car now, right? And they, they have no problem kind of stepping up to the plate and filling in these roles. While women, on the other hand, tend to be more emotional and will work on their grief by talking about it. So you'll find that there are women who feel more comfortable saying, you know, John would be so happy to see this happening. Can you imagine what he would say right now? Or I can't believe, you know, they will tell their story over and over again because they say it helps them with the process and works through it. While a man, if you try and corner him and ask him, he'll be like, well, yeah, but I'm about this for you. don't know how I feel already and you don't know, <laughs> right? There's often that, that response. Um, and in this situation of grieving, men often view social relationships as more of a time to share activities than emotions, which is why they'll happily have a, a dead yard and play dominoes the whole time and ludic versus, you know, actually hugging and saying, boy, thank you for being here, right? They, you know, they tend to want to fix it, like I said, and rely on their own resources, often keeping feelings and emotions to themselves, right? While women, we know, want to feel their way through grief. Um, men say that they limit, limit their expression of emotion because they may not want to appear weak, and again, we have this culture where we, we don't necessarily make men feel the most comfortable in expressing these negative emotions, to be upset that someone has passed away or to be upset that they have lost something. You know, oftentimes it's a boy is a man blow, just take it and keep it moving. 
if a man says that, boy, I am mourning the loss of my job. I'm mourning the loss of selling my car. You know, um, sometimes the things that men will talk about saying that they experience grief over, we might kiss with it and say, that is emotional, emotional over. Why you not be that way about me? You know, we're so quickly to, we're so quick to tend to weaponize how they're feeling versus actually giving them room to feel that way, right? And of course, women report frustration with men because we say that they're demonstrating little emotions and not wanting to talk about it, you know, and they view this as, women often view this as cold, right? But understanding how the different genders experience grief can also help to understand where each person is coming from right um along with that males we know are generally inward thinkers and they think of the situation not the emotional responses while women traditionally look for support right so when we look at gender differences in grief what is important to remember is that neither way is right or wrong it's just different both genders can learn from one another and if we learn to under understand and accept one's differences we can learn to support one another without trying to change them so for example if you know that a man is grieving and you know that he's not so good with wanting to talk about it you can say let me and you go take a drive or what need fixing hope you want me help you do deal with that and for a woman you know that she doesn't want you to find any solutions she literally just wants room to talk about how she's feeling you know, so instead of saying, chum and no cry or no bother with that or stop no man, just giving them the room to express themselves. So it's just to understand how we can maximize and show our support in a helpful way, right? And grief is a very personal and individual experience with everyone navigating through this journey in his or her own way. So even though these are very general things you know it boils down to the individual's personality the situation the loss itself in order for you to apply these different tips right so when we talk about interventions for a person that is experiencing quote-unquote normal grief we want the person who is grieving to actualize the loss meaning that you want them to come out of the denial situation. You want them to be able to identify and experience those feelings. So when Marcia asked earlier, you know, can somebody be grieving and not know what it is about? Perhaps there needs to be some exploration to say, what are those feelings? Allow them room to, to, to figure it out and to give word and expression to those feelings. Another tool or thing that we want to do in providing support for someone grieving is to assist them living without the disease so is it that we're going to help them figure out how to do things on their own is it something that you want to step up and assist them with that kind of thing help them find meaning in the loss and what i mean by that is not to tell them say oh everything happened for the greater good right or they've gone to a better place I know for sure when my best friend passed away and someone tell me that they've gone to a better place, I was asking how come them never carry me too? I want to go to that better place with them. Why him leave me behind, <laughs> right? When I talk about helping them to find meaning in the loss, it probably just means to say, how can we work through this? How can you grow as an individual despite all of this? How can we figure out a way to honor this person's memory and still move in, in, a, in a way that is forward, right? Facilitate emotional relocation of the deceased. So what I mean by this is uh, when someone loses something, there leaves a gap. And how do we redistribute all this love that was for that person to other things in a healthy way? You know, there are oftentimes you see situations where someone has lost a spouse and within six months you see them quote unquote move on is because there was this big gap left and somebody come in and fill the gap right because there was no 
probably any counseling process to kind of help them figure out their emotions and say, okay, I have a lot of love to give. I was giving all of this love to this person. That person isn't here anymore. What am I doing with the love, right? So that's part of it. We need to provide time to grieve. And when I say that, it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I'm giving you till Friday to feel sad, right? And there's no specific timeline either. Some persons need a week, some persons need a year, some persons need a couple months. Sometimes persons just need that time of year, right? So for example, you know, if your person died on June the 2nd, you find that maybe every year around that time, you tend to get a little sad. But outside of that, you're quote unquote okay, right? We allow for individual differences. You examine the coping styles as well. And this is very, 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 very important. What is it that you do when you are sad? How is it that you are coping? Are these coping skills healthy, right? Is it that you find that you're drinking more alcohol nowadays or you take up smoking or you're overeating or you find that you're engaging in intimate relationships far more than you would? Are you promiscuous now? Have you shut persons out as a result of this? So we really have to take a step back and look at and examine ourselves in terms of what we look like, what we feel like, how we navigate in that time, right? And how do we help? So one of the major things that I said that um, persons tend to ask is, I don't know what to say to persons that are grieving. I don't know how to be there, how to comfort them. I don't know how. I just feel like everything I'm going to say might offend them. I just feel like a fool. And so I end up not saying anything at all. And by not saying anything at all, it definitely leads that person who is grieving high and dry, right? You can imagine everybody in a room want to say something and because they're afraid to say something, nobody say anything at all. And so that person just feels very unsupported. Right, so I'm just giving a few communication don'ts or blunders of what not to say in order to kind of tell yourself what you can do or what you can't do. So for example, avoid denying the existence or importance of the bereaved feelings in any way or to any degree. Avoid suppressing or attempting to suppress the bereaved emotional expression, right? So you can say, no, no, we don't have time for that. No, stop your balling. Or how dare you? No, man, you don't have time. Stop your balling, man. You, 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 enough time passed, man. Or are really that your ball for? Is really that your grief boat? Is really that making you sad? Not do it, right? So all of these things, especially in our culture, we have a culture of gimmicks. We have a culture of teasing and, you know, of of saying that is only in extreme cases are we allowed to express our sadness when that's really not the case if i grieve because i have to cut back on self-care things like doing pedicures and manicures i can ball one day and say you know my hand used to look cute and i'm grieving the loss of my good looking nails right and i don't want nobody come to me and say that's your ball for no it's something i'm grieving about i feel it i feel the loss of it and I'm giving myself the room to feel sad about it, right? Um, again, another one is discouraging displays or expressions of emotions, you know, pressuring the bereaved not to grieve. Um, some individuals associate tears with emotional or personal weakness. And again, this is something that I find a lot of people do, whether consciously or unconsciously, which is, you see a person go through the funeral, they don't shed a tear and you say, boy, that person's strong, man. Boy, them, them, them have a strength to them. And there is no weakness in showing tears or sadness or emotions, right? Um, telling an individual he or she is too old to cry or that the deceased wouldn't have wanted the individual to cry are examples of not so subtle discouragement commonly heard in some families like so also wouldn't want to sad and crying all of this time don't it right but again allowing them to express their emotion and that kind of thing can really make a difference you avoid telling people how they should channel their distress right and of course you do have some religions or cultures that respond differently 
um, some with wailing, some with a great show of emotions, and others mourn relatively silently, right? So avoid telling mourners how they should be when they are grieving. Um, another one is pressuring the, the bereaved to discard the deceased personal items. Out of sight is not necessarily out of mind. And pressuring a person to get rid of belongings of someone who has lost things can definitely complicate the grief process. You know, familiarity of personal effects can assist in the grieving and recuperation process. So just having something that has the smell of that person or having something that has sentimental value can actually help the person. And so if you come and just get rid of everything or pressure them to give away things and you see somebody downtown wearing your loved one's shirt, you're going, you might have a, an emotional spiral, right? So in fact, memories evoked by the belongings of the deceased may be important to the grieving process. Um, another major thing that is a major blunder is offering false assurance is another expression of emotional distance. So saying things like time heals all wounds, everything is going to be fine, you're a strong person you'll get through, are all statements that can leave the mourner feeling more isolated and empty, right? So things like, um, so things like, oh my gosh, if I'm such a strong person, if I don't feel like coming out of bed one day, does that mean I'm weak? Um, everything is going to be fine. How can you say that? If everything was fine, this person would still be here. If everything was fine, my things that I have lost would still be with me. And time doesn't necessarily heal all wounds. Time can allow for room for things to get better, but time doesn't necessarily heal all wounds if you don't face it. You know what I mean? So we suggest to the bereaved that you don't really understand their depth of emotion. In addition, such statements and sentiments show a lack of respect towards the, the bereaved, whether you're conscious of it or not. And I hope I'm not mashing anybody can, you know, because I know these things are said, these things are said in, in, in an attempt to help, in an attempt to assage, you know, but the person who is grieving may interpret these things as emotionally distancing. Yes, Marcia. Yes, I totally agree because I my, my mother died just like about three months ago. I'm so sorry and, to hear that. Yes, and um I know in that in that time, you know, if when I tell I mean persons that my mother died, the first oh. thing they ask, how old was your mother? Mm -hmm. You know, and then when you say, Oh, so she was such and such an age, oh, well, she lived her life. You know, it's like wow. yeah, <laughs> because yeah. she it's, it's, because she's like old, it doesn't the grief that you feel. Yeah, yeah, I mean, she 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 that's okay because she 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 died at age, so you know yeah, she lived out her year. So what you yeah, yeah, I mean yeah. that was so sad, you know. Yeah. Yes, uh, Whittingham Gale. I hear you, know, Zoe, and I I I think I agree, but you know. I, I am guilty of saying some of these things like, you know, it's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fine. Or, you know, you're, you're strong. Um, so just hold the feet or something like that. But with not saying it to don't play how the person is feeling. But no, I'm just thinking, I really don't know what else to say. <laughs> well, I you know really what? don't. That's a very good point to make. And, and I'm in agreement with you. But, you know, it's one of those things where if you say phrases like this in passing, that's when it can come across quite slicing, so to speak. But if it's a case where you hear them out, you give them room to talk about how they're feeling, and then as you're wrapping up the conversation, you say stuff like this, that's different. Okay. If you're like, you get, you get what I mean? So that is the difference in what I'm saying, as opposed to you just walk up to them and say, you go all right, man. Just go and hold it okay. versus how are you feeling? And you listen and wait for that answer. And then you say, okay, based on what you're saying, it seems like you're moving, you're going through the motions and hopefully in time, your, your wounds will heal. You know okay. what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's what we're talking about. Thank you for bringing that up. Good point, Marcia. And 
you know, I think this is another one that leads to what Marcia was alluding to a while ago, which is comments that minimize the loss. Comments such as you can always have another baby or it was for the best or I know how you must feel. It denies that the loss is unique and the individual is irreplaceable, right? So for example, one child cannot replace another. Each life is unique, right? So when we hear things like it was for the best, so when you hear something like that, so you say, oh, it was for the best that I must continue life without my mother, you know, or the person, you know, these, these are the kind of things that a person may be thinking to themselves, which further kind of discourages them from wanting to reach out or to express, you know what I mean? And again, I know that a lot of these things are said in an attempt to feel, help the person feel better, you know? Other things to avoid saying as well, especially when the person is at the angry stage of the grieving process is, it was God's will. God never gives us more than we can bear. At least he or she isn't suffering. I know how you must feel. It can be kind of insensitive, right? Because you can never really know the depth of their pain, you know? I hear two people's hands raised, Lord Amasha Khan, whose two hands I see, the host, and I also see Brown Lawrence. So can we hear from Brown Lawrence first and then my co-host? Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Zoe. Yes. I, there are times when persons are grieving and you are there hoping to probably want to say the right thing, but yes. you recognize that there's a person who, who is grieving, saying the wrong thing, and you're like, um, what yes. should I say? Because the other one might, who might say to you, um, the Lord knows best why, why he, he, he took X from me. And you're like, so he said not to say that. Or they might say something like, um, something, some, of, some of these things that you're mentioning not to yes. say. So when they say this thing, these things, what is it that is left for you to say? You, you have mentioned some of the time that being silent may not be the right thing, but there are times when I recognize that silence may be the appropriate Sometimes thing. it might be the best. Yeah, well, it comes down to the, the individual situation, and you give a very good point, Brown Lawrence, because if and that if you person... don't agree with them when they say the wrong thing, they don't feel good? Yeah, that's true, that's true. <laughs> it, it's a tough thing, which is what we have always been acknowledging. The fact is the grieving process is a messy thing. It's not a neat and tidy thing where the person ball and then they no hug and then they say, oh, I feel so much better now and then I move on. You know, it's a continuous thing that, you know, you are bound to make mistakes on either end, both the mourner and the supporter. And it's just a situation of understanding each other's intentions. So when you hear a mourner say it was for the best, or, you know, um, you know, it was God's will or God may give me more than I can bear. You know, maybe you can, you can probably probe a little further and say, why you say that? Is it that you're trying to find meaning in the loss? Or is it that, you know, you genuinely feel angry at this stage? Or, you know, per perhaps you need to seek the reason behind it because maybe what they're saying might be giving you indications that they're quite self-destructive at that point. And that's also something we have to be very cognizant of as well, right? Um, what can be appropriate to say is that you or a friend experienced a similar loss and that recuperating is a long, slow process, but you will recover with time. You know, it's better to say that you're sorry for the loss and you're available to them. Let me know how I can be there for you versus, you know, especially for those persons who are rendered speechless when you're like, I don't know what to say, but you can say, you know what? I'm sorry to hear about what's happened. I'm available anytime you want to talk or let me know if there's anything that I can do. Remember, I'm here for you. You know, sometimes just saying something like that is enough and, let get, and it puts it back into the mourner's hands to reach out for help, knowing that you're there, you know? So like I said, each individual situation is different and unique. And so it's something that, you know, you have to be quite discerning in those situations as well. Another one is inappropriate intimacy or self-disclosure. Sometimes when you self-disclose, it shifts the focus away from the one you are helping. 
right? To a self-focused discussion, right? So while some self-disclosure may be appropriate and even helpful, excessive discussion, you know, can may, may, may defeat the purpose. So for example, you can say, boy, when my father did, you know, I just roll and tumble and lose so much weight and you go into all of these dramatics and the person turn around and comfort you. And then you leave the conversation being like, wait, did I help this person or that person turn around help me? <laughs> you know, sometimes self-disclosure can be like, you're saying it so that they can know that they're not alone in how they're feeling and they can, they can relate to you on a deeper level. However, if you go too much into it, perhaps, it can be a situation where they turn around and say, oh gosh, we never know that both you, you're all right. And they turn around being concerned about you rather than, you know, being, giving themselves room to feel how they want to feel, you know? Um, avoiding emotionally painful subjects or discussions. There are some mourners who will want to talk about it. You will have some that will never bring it up, you know, and you leave it at that. But if you do have some that want to bring, up, bring it up and want to talk about it, and it may trigger a tearful response, um, please don't shut them down, especially if it's something that happened quite, quite recently. You know, don't avoid mentioning the disease or avoid topics that you think might encourage expressions of grief or bring back painful memories or recollections of the disease. So if you remember a joke that involved the person, you know, and that person is bringing it up, the mourner is bringing it up, or in the office, you all lost someone that you worked closely with and you want to talk about it, you know, it can, it can be helpful because you're keeping that person's memory alive. There are some persons who say, why we don't talk about this person anymore? It may be too painful, but part of grieving is talking about the good times and remembering the happy times as well. You know, don't just change the topic or avoid mentioning the person anymore or refuse to listen to memories that the bereaved wish to share. However, if it is a case where you find those discussions triggering, then by all means, avoid it. You know, but if it's a case where... Avoid it, right? And don't worry, guys, we're winding down. I know I've gone over the time a little bit, but we did start a little late, right? And of course, we need to avoid the inappropriate inquisitiveness and questioning. You know, excessive questionings discourage communication. When it happened, how it happened, what them happened? Were they gurgling? Was it painful? Did they, were they bawling out? All the nitty gritty details. Right, we have to be very mindful about that. Yes, Kerry Brown Ellis. Oh, yes, Mrs. Ellis. Uh, yes, it's only me. Yes. All right, what I have realized though is that persons who would have had a, a loss and, um, you know, after talking to them, one of the challenges they said they would have experienced is that their phones are flooded with calls and people mm -hmm. calling. They don't know, they don't want to answer, they don't want to talk, but persons insist on calling. And mm -hmm. sometimes they really feel bad for not answering, but I would say you don't have to answer. Very good. It's your time to grieve. And I mean, sometimes, and what I try to avoid, say if I hear that a staff has a death or a loss, rather than call that person directly, you know, I could send a text message and they can always read it at their own convenience. Very good. Beautiful. But oftentimes you hear they complain that persons just keep bombarding their phones. Give me some time. I just lost my husband. I'm, I right. can't talk to anybody. But then persons doesn't seem to be understanding that or getting that, that you need to give persons a little time Beautiful. when they have had a loss. Don't just flood I'm the phone so and blast the phone with home. calls. It's, mm -hmm. it's annoying for them. I'm so happy you brought that up and it can add to that feeling yeah. of being overwhelming, overwhelmed and it also can reinforce their desire to feel to be isolated. They just want to shut everybody yes. out. Shut everybody mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. but and like the person start worrying. And, and that is why I started off this evening's session with looking at the stages of grief where the first couple stages is denial, isolation and anger. You know, and during that time, that person just needs room to just express and just have it out with themselves, so to speak. 
So the bomb rushing, what I typically tell persons if they ask for advice in terms of when to reach out and to send that text message is usually like um, about a few days to a week after the funeral. Because we all know that leading up to the funeral, everybody's around helping to organize and get everything sorted and situated and families around and everything. But what happens when everything goes back to quote unquote normal? And that person is left in the empty house or left with that one less person there. That is the best time to kind of reach out and say, I know the funeral just a week ago. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Let me know when is a good evening to come and visit. If you're open to that, those kind of things. Because I'll always say that when a person is mourning and they're going through the motions, the survival mode is usually right up until the funeral. And then once all the relatives fly back and everybody gone home to them own different places and you're left with yourself, you know, that is usually an appropriate time to reach out and to offer the counseling and that kind of thing. And I see in the yes, after the funeral, yes, time for lots of mourning, right? So yeah, that's what I have here in terms of, you know, um, or discussion on grief. I have one quick video that I'd want us to play to wrap up things. And then we can end with any final questions or concerns that you guys may have. And so, yeah, so I'll play this video. We'll listen to this song briefly and then we'll just wrap up quickly. If you have any questions or concerns, let's type them 